Morning folks, Dave Canterbury at the Pathfinder School. What I thought we'd do today is start a little bit of a short series here. It'll probably take me a couple, three segments to get this done, but I want to talk about cold weather camping and wool blanket mentality. And like I said before in a video a few days ago, it's not a good idea for anyone who is a novice or doesn't know really what they're doing or hasn't had quite a bit of dirt time to go out and try to sleep with just a wool blanket in weather that's below freezing. It's not a smart idea. There's a lot of things that you have to understand about camping with a wool blanket that we're going to talk about in this two or three part series. The first thing I want to talk to you about is what's called the browse bag. And the browse bag is a very important part of wool blanket type sleeping. And you can make that browse bag from a couple different things. You can make it from canvas, and that's traditionally the way they were made. And basically it's just a sleeping bag of sorts that was made out of canvas and you would fill that sleeping bag with debris to make a mattress and then you could empty it out and you could roll it up and it would fold up small inside your pack. The key is that you need four inches of insulation compressed to battle conduction from the cold ground. So that browse bag becomes that bed of insulation. Instead of taking two logs and piling leaves into those two logs, smashing them down, piling more leaves, smashing them down, rolling around and all that stuff, having a ground mat and a ground pad, all of those types of things, you can avoid all of that by just carrying the browse bag or by manufacturing a browse bag on the fly. And what we're going to do today is I've got an extra wool blanket out here with me that's just a cheapy 90% wool, 10% cotton blanket. It's the one we saw on our website. It's the cheapest one we have. Um, I think it, it's, uh, if I remember right, it comes from India. They're pretty good with textiles, so we thought it was a pretty good blanket to carry. It's not overly expensive, but it's only a twin size blanket. And the key to sleeping in cold weather with a wool blanket is you've got to have the right wool blanket. But we'll talk about that later on in the series. What I want to talk about today is how do we make the browse bag. So basically all we're going to do is we're going to take this twin size wool blanket and we're going to fold it in half and we're going to do a quick whip stitch down one side and across the bottom and that will just leave us like an open sleeping bag type design that we can then stuff with leaves and then we can close that in if we want to as well or just fold it underneath. Now the easiest way to make this happen on the fly is to number one 36 bank line. Number 36 bank line works great for this. If you're carrying bank line this is part of the reason I advocate it. It's really good and quick and simple for this. The other thing you need is you need a really good size needle that's going to punch big holes and you can go through fabric really fast. Now this one here is a very oversized sail needle. I don't know if you can see that or not. This thing is super huge. It's almost like an awl with a needle hole in it. I can't tell you exactly where to get these. I'm almost positive this is military surplus. I was given about 10 of these in a couple different sizes from a really close friend of mine who's one of my instructors and I don't know where he got them but I assume that they're military surplus. The other thing is I would look on eBay and places like that but I will start to look for these larger needles now that we're into the winter season. These larger needles come in really handy for punching holes and things like bark to make containers and things like that as well but they're going to work really good for our purpose today. So stay with me and I will talk a little bit about this whip stitch. I'm not going to bore you by watching me stitch up this whole bag but I will show you what I mean by a quick whip stitch. Okay so what I've done here is I've folded this blanket widthways not lengthwise. I'd rather have it a little bit shorter than my body length because I'm really worried about my core and I can always fetal up in the fetal position a little bit if I need to but I want the width is what I'm really worried about so when I roll around on my shoulders things like that I'm going to stay nice and warm and snuggled in there. Now all I'm going to do is do a quick whip stitch with this thing and my spacing is going to be two to three inches between stitches because this shouldn't be something that takes a really long time to do. And I cut myself a length of bank line that's about three times longer than the length that I'm going to sew up. And you can see these stitches are about an inch to two inches apart and I'm going about an inch deep into the wool blanket when I punch my hole. Now again, you don't need to worry about punching a hole in a wool blanket with this needle because you're punching through fibers. It's not, it's a little different than if you were punching through leather and it's going to leave a permanent hole. These fibers are going to close back up. It's not that big of a deal. And if your stitches aren't perfectly even, you know, you're not sewing up a shirt here that has to be absolutely perfect. All you're trying to do is close something in that you're going to use to fill with leaves or what have you. And you could use leaves, you could use plant matter, dead, dead uh, 
weeds, things like that. Anything that you can get your hands on, you can use. And this process of making this browse bed on the fly like this should not take you any more than about 15 minutes. If it does, you probably need to practice your sewing skills. The biggest problem you're going to have is when you first start this paracord trying to, or this uh, bank line trying to knot up on you a little bit here and there like it just did right there on me because of the twist coming off the roll. But once you get past most of that, you're not going to be having that problem near as much. And like I said, if these stitches aren't exactly evenly spaced and all of that stuff, I don't care. Anywhere between an inch and two inches is fine with me. If you pull that and it rolls that edge a little bit, that's not going to hurt anything. Don't worry about that. But you don't really have to pull it that tight. So we'll go all the way down this side and down the bottom. And then we'll go to the next step. Okay, so when we're finished, and again, we've got this folded widthwise, not lengthwise. I just went through at the bottom, doubled through it one time with a half hitch, and just tied a knot in the end and left it hang. So now we have our browse bag, which basically is a sleeping bag that we're going to fill with brows or leaves or whatever the case may be. In colonial times at Fort Boonesboro, when people first came to the fort and moved into a cabin, before they had furnishings and things like that, because they were new to the area, they would make a pillow ticking or a ticking material mattress just like this for the most part, just whip stitch down the sides, down the bottom, fill the thing with hay, and then whip stitch across the top, and that was their mattress. So this is not a new concept, it's a very old concept. But as far as bushcraft goes, it's something that a lot of people don't understand that is a necessity for a cold night's sleep. And if you've got a secondary blanket that you're carrying with you anyway, and Horace Kephart said himself, if you're going to carry wool blankets, make sure you've got two. If you're going to carry wool blankets and you've got a secondary thinner one or one that's not as good as your main blanket, which should be queen size, that you're using for a shroud or maybe you're using that for a match coat of sorts or a secondary piece of outerwear, you can use that and repurpose it for your browse bed. And again, this took about 20 minutes to get this done real time. Now all we have to do it is stuff it up. Okay, so once you've got this filled up, and this one's filled up with leaves, and grass and browse and sometimes that's going to be tough for you to find especially in a wetter weather environment where maybe it snowed and got a little warmer outside things like that but it took me about 40 minutes to get this thing full so now i've got right at an hour invested in this but it's going to give me as many comfortable nights sleep as i want out here without a long fire and that's going to save me a lot of calories in the long run of cutting and burning wood now the top of this thing we could fold it under if we want to or we can just put a quick whip stitch across the top of it. If we just started on the bottom and ended at the top and left ourselves plenty of tag, we could have whip stitched it right there. I didn't do that because I generally tuck it under, but I think with this one, I'm going to go ahead and whip stitch the top of it anyway and go from there. It's really easy to get this undone. The reason I generally fold it under is in case I need to refill it. I don't want to have to take that stitching out, but in this case, I may go ahead and stitch it up because I got a lot of brows on this thing. Okay, now I've put this browse bed into a canoe shelter type configuration just to show you the browse bed itself on the ground not necessarily to show you this type of shelter system this can be used with any shelter any tarp configuration that you want to use any type of natural material shelter that you want to use you can use the browse bed with that i just put this here so you'd have something to visualize basically i have two tripods holding the canoe up on the side i have an eight by eight tarp stake down in the back that flaps over the canoe out here to form the shelter the browse bed is the key element to this thing. The important part of this is that you get this thing stuffed full enough that when you're on it and you're laying down on this thing, you've got four inches of insulation compressed. And again, it doesn't have to take up your legs. Don't have, you don't have to worry about it. You're worried about this core part of your body. You can lay the back of your legs against that thing real easy, just like this. As long as it goes down to where your knees bend, it's going to be really, really comfortable for you. This is a very, very comfortable mattress. The key element to this is the insulative factor and battling conduction. That's the first step in sleeping through a cold night without a long fire in wool blankets. You can call this a browse bed. You can call it anything you want to. It was called a straw bed in the 18th century. Many of these were made just out of tick material, like I said, stuffed with hay or straw. Some of them were stuffed with down, and then they were used 
on the ground in the cabins and then eventually on top of a rope bed when the rope beds were created or built um, as time went by. So it's not a new concept, it's an old concept, but again, it's one of those concepts that people forget about. It doesn't take a long time to build this, and this is not something you'd do for an overnight stay. If you're going out an overnight stay, take an MMS system with you. Take a military sleep system with you. You'll be good to go. If you're planning on going out there for a week or something, you want to do it traditional, you want to try to get back to the versatility and flexibility of wool and wool blankets, this is the way to do it. Like I said, I got about an hour invested in this, and if I was going to be here for four or five days, like I'm going to be next week during deer camp, starting tomorrow, I'm going to be out here for four or five days. It's well worth that hour of time to get a good night's sleep every night and not have to worry about feeding a long fire and spending the calories to cut down the wood. Well, I'm Dave Canterbury at the Pathfinder School, guys, and I thank you for everything you do for me, for my family, my business, and everyone affiliated with the Pathfinder School. I'll be back with another video as soon as I can. Thanks, guys.